what I decided to do, rather than just jump into nuclear safety, which is a, can be seen by some as a somewhat esoteric subject, uh, I wanted to put, start off with a particular context, which is the environment, and doing, start off in a more global uh, view. Of, I could, so basically, I'm going to touch on a number of subjects, obviously energy and challenges uh, to the environment and economic development. I'm going to start off talking about climate change because I'm a, uh, a, a strong believer in climate change and uh, the link to carbon emissions. Uh, others I know don't necessarily believe that, but nonetheless it is a challenge not just to nuclear but to any energy uh, options that we, we choose uh, and it does uh, have impacts in major impacts in terms of, uh, of the potential for natural disasters. Then having done that we'll uh, look at nuclear energy in particular uh, with a, a few uh, dis side discussions on other technology options and with a focus on resilience and reliability. And I do that because I believe that we are going to be challenged in the coming decades with the impacts of climate change. And it's not going to be just us in Ontario or our brothers and sisters south of the border, but it's going to be global. And climate change is not a localized effect, it is a global effect. And finally, uh, costs, which relate, uh, we'll discuss that because that does link in with, uh, if you wish, with safety, but also with respect to the, uh, the options and the impact that things such as uh, fracking uh, and, and um, the natural gas uh, supply in North America has had on all the energy options, not just nuclear. So climate change, you, I'm sure you've all been following uh, what has been transpiring uh, through the uh, through the intergovernmental panel on climate change and their various uh, working group reports. The most recent one uh, painted a rather bleak picture of the future, uh, which is uh, a somewhat harsh, harsh future, mm -hmm. and we can expect uh, increased deaths and hardship globally, increasing economic losses and global challenges to sustainable development from climate related disasters. That was a sort of one of their summary conclusions. So that kind of, uh, you can't talk of any particular energy option, in my view, one being better than the other, uh, without having it put in the a more global context and a, a broader social context. So. Uh, the, there is a bit of a conundrum associated in the link between climate change and energy because if we start off we have, uh, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be, uh, start off with energy production and then you have, uh, what have I got there, very bad slide, uh, okay carbon emissions, okay that's the link the, uh, to uh, climate change and then the uh, human uh, impacts, uh, uh, both uh, on, uh, on, on human life and economic uh, impacts of, the, uh, of some of the uh, effects of climate change. And in terms of recovering from those, you need energy. So you're back to where you started. You can't uh, recover your resources without rebuild your cities without large amounts of uh, energy input. So as there is a, a direct linkage there that we have to keep in mind. Um, it's worthwhile looking at climate disasters and the impacts of climate disasters. Uh, in the last uh, uh, 40 odd years, we, if we look at the, uh, around the globe, we see that climate uh, disasters have contributed uh, many thousands of deaths, uh, 
primarily in Africa and Asia, where the populations are high and the, uh, and the infrastructure isn't as well developed. Uh, whereas the economic costs of these uh, tend to be large, much larger than the, uh, the, uh, the deaths in the industrialized countries in North America and Asia. So basically, you've built, that's why I talk about uh, the economic costs or the things that relate back to the demand for energy to recover from uh, these events. And it's worthwhile, uh, you can look at the deadliest climate disasters in the, in the last 40 years. Most of them come from storms, droughts, storms and floods, and in the Europe heat waves, and they are in the tens to hundreds of thousands of, uh, of fatalities. Whereas the costliest climate disasters occur primarily as in, the, uh, in the US uh, and uh, Asian countries such as China and North Korea. Uh, the um, storm in, in the US, storms are, and hurricanes, basically hurricanes are the, uh, the major um, uh, challenges. So we have that as a sort of a global uh, uh, background, if you wish, and it is, in my view, uh, linked to further challenges from climate change as we go forward, unless we do something uh, quickly. Um, interestingly also, if you look at the, uh, the, the largest hurricanes um, in the US, they've occurred uh, Primarily in the uh, in the last uh, the last uh, five to ten years, uh, Sandy, Igor, uh, Katrina was actually a small one relative to Sandy. Uh, so it just gives you some idea that the, uh, the uh, these hurricanes are uh, major uh, storms have major impacts as you quite imagine. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing though is you look at where the hurricanes occur in the US, they all are on the Gulf and up the East Coast. And that's where a large percentage of the US nuclear plants are located. Uh, and the interesting thing is they have survived those challenges admirably. Uh, so the, which is what is to be expected, the containment structures are strong reinforced concrete uh, uh, structures which are not easily damaged by high winds and, uh, and, 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 and uh, missiles generated from those high winds. But they, uh, the issue is always what is the vulnerability? Then you have to look at flooding, how well they're protected against floods, which can be uh, certainly generated by these uh, these storms, and again they survived admirably. Uh, however, as we'll see later, Fukushima was an example of a plant or station which was not adequately designed uh, in terms of, uh, of protection against flooding, and the vulnerability showed up after the, uh, that big earthquake. So what is nuclear safety? Well, nuclear safety is uh, essentially not a single concept. There's m uh, many uh, layers to it. Uh, and, but the focus of nuclear safety is on minimizing potential hazards which could impact people uh, uh, and uh, detrimentally and avoiding harm to the environment over the full life cycle of the nuclear facility. Uh, it's not by itself unique although nuclear is there uh, and uh, tends to be the focus because of radiation, um, but any other industrial or scale technological activity is safety is an issue. Uh, we've seen that uh, in deep sea oil uh, uh, drilling, deep water horizon disaster, high speed rail transport in China, uh, the, uh, even our subways, Toronto, uh, uh, DC and uh, uh, Valencia in Spain, uh, where subway uh, accidents 
have occurred uh, due to uh, uh, and uh, are associated with inattention to uh, safety. You also get it in pharmaceutical products. Uh, so you, uh, you know, the Vioxx uh, of Andia and obviously uh, the one that had big uh, impacts was the uh, the uh, the uh, someone helped me on that drug which uh, caused a lot of uh, uh, thalidomide. thalidomide that's right yeah my uh, my uh, age is showing my short-term memory is going and uh, obviously in manned space programs but interesting the one I didn't put on there is uh, the largest uh, transport uh, 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 accident in, in history was in the Philippines. There was a ferry called the Donna Paz, which struck an oil tanker in the middle of the night, and the oil caught a light. The ferry was overloaded, continually overloaded, so there's poor safety culture there. Uh, the crew was not at, uh, was at full complement, but instead of having two people on the bridge, there was one person on the bridge, and the other person who should have been on the bridge was downstairs with the other crew members playing cards and drinking beer. Uh, so that was a egregious uh, uh, procedural uh, non-compliance, if you wish. Um, and the result was 4, 000, in excess of 4,300 people died. The ones who jumped off uh, into the flaming water either were burnt or were killed by sharks. There was a very, you know, a lot of sharks in that area. So it was a, and the reason I say greater than 4,300 is that they didn't have records of the total number of people on the ferry. So it, it uh, but these uh, events that occur usually you can always, just as in nuclear, you can track them back to not just the initiate, initiating event itself, but it's usually compounded by a whole bunch of, of uh, other factors, one of which is uh, safety culture. Is the operating organization governed by a strong safety culture? Do they take safety seriously? Do they make decisions on the basis of uh, mission imperative, as in the case of the uh, NASA and the, uh, and the space shuttles? Uh, or on the basis of uh, uh, economic drivers at all at the expense of safety. So you need to have organizations that are focused on safety. And uh, basically achieving nuclear safety is a, there's a shared responsibility, uh, in fact, of multiple organizations involved in the activity. In the case of a nuclear, uh, nuclear safety, you have many organizations which are involved in site selection, environmental assessment, design and licensing, the construction and operation, and then de decommissioning and use fuel management. Those are the life cycle activities. But uh, they need to have a strong positive safety culture in the organizations, and it relates both to the collective body of the organization as well as individuals. Um, so safety culture was uh, in, in the nuclear area was, it became very strongly divine, defined following the Chernobyl accident. There was a, uh, a, a post-accident review meeting in September of 1986 that was organized by the IAEA, which stands for International Atomic Energy Agency, and there was a, a group called INSAG that they had established, which is uh, the Independent Nuclear Safety Advisory Group, and they came up with the this, these definitions of safety culture, which uh, I'm not going to read out. You can read that uh, uh, for yourself. Uh, it's a bit wordy, but that's what it is. But basically, it involves putting safety first and maintaining a, a focus on safety. And that has been carried through uh, in, 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 the, in the organizations, especially in Canada and, and the US uh, and some of the European countries, it wasn't apparent in the, uh, uh, as strongly in, in Japan uh, until after Fukushima. Um, the other concept is defense in depth, where you basically, you, uh, in order to achieve nuclear safety, it's not just preventing accidents happening, that's part of it, it's, it's 
almost impossible in any engineer system to say something's not going to fail. You cannot maintain a high degree of reliability, doing appropriate maintenance, uh, but the, you, if something fails, what, how do you cope with that? So defense in depth, there are five levels that the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency have defined. The first one re just relates to the design and the, and, 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 and the, uh, uh, the quality of materials uh, that you have uh, uh, in, the, in the plant. Also monitoring the, uh, the equipment, doing uh, maintenance in service inspections, in other words, looking to see if things are degrading and then taking action to, uh, to, uh, to uh, replace if necessary. And it all, uh, so the other thing that keeps coming up in all of these levels is trained operators. You can't operate something without trained operators. At least you can't tr operate safely without trained operators and having appropriate training programs. So the, the next level, it's, they, they have uh, systems, with control systems, which are designed to maintain the plant in, a, uh, in what's called a safe operating envelope or region. Uh, if you, something fails and you go out of there, then you have automatic actions from special safety systems, either to shut down the reactors, um, inject emergency coolant water into the reactors, and contain any release uh, so that you have containment structures with uh, with uh, as part of the special safety systems. Once, if you go beyond that, then you're going into an area where you haven't necessarily uh, uh, be, uh, there's a, a whole wide range of, 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 uh, of uh, possible uh, scenarios or paths that might be taken and you have to then be concerned about mitigating having adequate means to mitigate. So, uh, and that was basically highlighted very strongly by the Fukushima accident. So you're trying to ensure that you don't, you can limit the accident progressing to the point where the fuel gets more overheated and potentially uh, melts. Again, you need to have trained operators and staff and what has come about uh, from Fukushima and has been implemented both in, uh, in, in all North American uh, nuclear uh, plants is uh, what they call, uh, we call emergency uh, mitigating equipment. And this is transportable equipment. It's not fixed, but you, it's located off-site at elevations which are not susceptible to flooding, for example. And there's basically, you can bring them on site either like a, you know, these special fire engines or special pumps and electrical generators and they are pre-planned uh, hookups where you can do a quick connection which was not possible in, in Fukushima for because uh, they hadn't planned for it. And then finally there's the off-site uh, emergency uh, response which relates to uh, limiting any impacts should there be releases from off-site from the plant. Um, so if we now look at Fukushima, uh, there were four stations that were directly affected by the, uh, by the earthquake and the, uh, and the resultant uh, tsunami. All of the operating stations, uh, not all of the sta uh, units in the, in the stations were operating at the time of the event, but the ones that were operating shut down automatically. Uh, Fukushima Daishi, Daishi just stands for one in J Japanese, had six units, three operating, and three were shut down. Um, Fukushima Daini, which is two, the second unit uh, station, which is about 30 kilometers down south of uh, uh, Daishi, had four units, uh, and then there was the Onagawa uh, station, which had three units. Uh, there was a fourth single unit. Uh, in uh, in Tokai, uh, so the the, th uh, the three units that were affected, uh, plus the fourth unit uh, which was shut down, but uh, got some hydrogen heavily uh, 
transfer, transported from the third unit, they um, basically suffered a total loss of electrical power because the earthquake didn't damage the plants, but it did damage, in some case, knock down the transmission towers connecting it to the grid. So Daishi lost connection to the grid and they were now relying on their emergency diesel generators. Unfortunately, in the first four, the generators were on the ocean side uh, at a relatively low level, got flooded, and we all know that electrical equipment and water don't like one another, especially if it's salt water. So they uh, basically they lost the ability to uh, both generate electricity from the diesel generators and transmit it within the station. Interestingly, the other two, uh, units five and six, were at a slightly higher elevation on the coast, and they didn't lose all their generators. They lost one of two generators, and they were able to operate those two units on the one generator, so they, they weren't impacted. Daini, which was down the coast, the, uh, they were, did not suffer the same degree of uh, flooding as Daishi, nor did Onagawa, uh, although they did uh, temporarily uh, lose some uh, of their connection to the, to the grid, but they maintained their backup uh, diesel generators. So that, as we just go through this very quickly, the earthquake itself was a, a, a massive earthquake, uh, sufficiently large that there was actual physical uh, displacement of the coastline. At uh, Fukushima Daiichi, the coast actually line actually subsided one meter and moved about four meters east. So it, and that's partly because this, there were tectonic plates uh, which, which uh, were being displaced. The tsunami which followed about a, a, a uh, uh, an hour afterwards had a, a very high wave height <laughs> and it was, well it wasn't one wave, it was a series of waves uh, uh, but the wave height was accentuated by the coastline subsiding and the horizontal shift of, of, of the coastline. Uh, so you, the net wave height was 14 meters ab above the normal uh, uh, level of the sea. <laughs> So uh, the, unit, the first four units were only about 10 meters above sea level, whereas units five and six were at elevation of 13 meters, which was... Uh, I'll just quickly run these. I won't talk too much about them. It just gives you some idea of the uh, tsunami uh, coming in, hitting the station, uh, then moving around the equipment, uh, the tanks. A lot of these tanks were actually washed out to sea. You can see the movement there, the here is the back of the plant, and uh, then the uh, it start to flood up the side of the, uh, the reactor buildings, and finally then receded, and you can see in the lower one here, there's a car, which has been basically transported by the tsunami waves, and uh, pushed up against the side of the uh, the uh, the plant. So it gives you some idea of the, the, the strength of these tsunami waves. They are very, there's a lot of energy in them. And this basically just shows you the, uh, the pictorial or cartoon form, the, the inundation, as they call the height of the flooding. So the diesel generators were located in, this, in the basement of this building, uh, which is the wrong place to put them. That was a design deficiency never recognized by either the operators or the Japanese regulators. So that was a, a, a problem. In terms of the emergency response, there were challenges. They had no power. They were working at, in the middle of the night. All they had were torches. You can see some of uh, the people trying to read engineering diagrams, flowcharts of where to try and reconnect water to the reactors using a, a flashlight. They had to uh, basically uh, uh, rig up uh, temporary uh, power connections from the outside. The lines, the cable that they had was not pre-planned. 
and a lot of the cables didn't reach where they wanted, so they had to do on the spot splicing. Uh, and then there was extreme amounts of damage on the site because of the tsunami. The uh, you know, sewer uh, covers had been blown away and in the dark they had to move carefully so they didn't fall down uh, in, the, in, the, in the hole. So it, it, was a, it was not a very, uh, uh, not at all a safe site. Um, as a result, however, they uh, you had um, the, um, the, the small containment vessels ultimately got breached and they got releases outside the plant and predominantly the deposition was in the northwest of the plant and that was because of the prevailing winds at the time that the releases were occurring plus the meteorological conditions. There was rain uh, which uh, basically tends to wash out the uh, uh, radioactive uh, isotopes such as iodine and cesium and deposit them on the ground and the colouring indicates the, uh, the extent of uh, or, or the activity. As you can see most of the highest activity was in this region here. Now that activity was less than uh, what occurred in Chernobyl and of a, a smaller area than in Chernobyl just because Chernobyl was a, a very uh, large rapid event. There was no containment. Uh, once the reactor uh, blew open uh, because of high pressure in uh, steam in the reactor, the, uh, there was no, uh, uh, nothing to contain the radioactivity. So there's large plumes uh, and there was all kinds of stories about uh, uh, things that happened. For example, uh, a, uh, a train running by the site at the time of the, the accident was on its way to Sweden and some pieces of fuel were actually landed on some of the, co the uh, freight coaches mm -hmm. uh, and they ended up uh, being detected in Sweden. Mm -hmm. The other problem uh, that Fukushima, uh, I mean Chernobyl had, was that the Soviets at the time did not adequately respond to, uh, to, the, uh, to the event and the challenge to, in particular, people in Belarus. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. One of the things that they didn't do was to distribute what they call potassium iodide tablets. And potassium iodide is basically non-radioactive iodine, which you take and it floods effectively your thyroid. So if you have any uptake of radioactive iodine, it just passes through your body and doesn't accumulate in the thyroid. Um, and as a result of that, there were, well, there were initially 28 uh, sort of early deaths of first responders in Chernobyl and these were the firefighters who were battling fires on the roof of the plant in the dark and not aware that there were pieces of nuclear fuel there and they got high levels of exposure in excess of 6,000 6, millisieverts and that's a level which with, uh, will cause uh, 50% uh, fatalities within six months. So 28 of those people uh, have died from the, uh, that exposure. Subsequently, over the next uh, 20 years, there were another 28 deaths of children who were young and living in a part of Belarus called Gomel and were exposed to the radioiodine deposition that occurred and they never got the ray potassium iodide tablets. In Poland, however, the, uh, which was affected, they uh, immediately distributed potassium iodide tablets and they never saw one single case of, of thyroid cancer as a result, whereas the thar there were about a thousand cases in this area of Belarus and that was prevent those were preventable. Uh, the Soviet Union was, uh, in my view, was culpable for, for those deaths, but can't do very much now because the Chernobyl basically uh, precipitated or helped uh, the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. So talking about the exposures now, we, which is the, the hazard that people worry about, um, 
If we look at the average annual exposure in, say, Canada, uh, it's, it varies, but this, uh, this would be typical of uh, uh, a little higher than in, say, Toronto, uh, and a little higher than Hamilton. Hamilton is a little higher than Toronto, uh, just because of the geological uh, differences. But most of what we get fr from the naturally occurring radiation, which is of primordial origin, in other words, from the Big Bang time, uh, is from radon gas, which comes from the uh, soil and from rocks and typically accumulates in basements. So uh, if you over-insulate your basement and you don't have enough uh, <coughs> air, uh, airflow, you might be subjecting yourself to higher levels. And that actually happened in the US after the 1972 oil crisis, where everybody went and basically did a lot of uh, insulation to try and cut down the losses from their houses. But uh, it had a negative impact in terms of radon exposure. We, uh, we, we also get, uh, th these are units of what they call millisieverts uh, per year per person. Uh, so uh, as you can see, radon is almost 50% of what we get. We get uh, another point, uh, roughly half a millisievert uh, each year from what's in the ground, just uh, by being outdoors. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, then get exposure from cosmic rays. Uh, these are, so these things are thing, uh, these exposures are ones that we can't do very much about, uh, even if we relocate. Uh, we can't all relocate to the lowest uh, uh, background radiation levels. But we also get, we also have internal radiation ourselves. We are all ra radioactive. Uh, this comes about because we eat. Uh, things such as bananas and Brazil nuts and other foods which contain potassium-40, which is a naturally occurring radioactive uh, isotope. And that accumulates in our bodies in different parts of our bodies. So we are, we are radioactive uh, and close proximity. Uh, we can all irradiate one another, but uh, I wouldn't be concerned about that level of radiation. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't be concerned about this level of radiation because if, we, if it was damaging, we should all by now be dead. The question is, why aren't we dead? Well, there's a, there are some reasons for that. We can discuss that a little later. But the other thing is that it's not just us. There are other uh, variations. So if you look at Canada, on average, 2.8 millisieverts. Go to Finland. They get about eight millisieverts per year because of the, uh, the amount of granite that they have there, which contains higher levels of, of uh, naturally occurring radioactive material. If you go and live in Denver, you're going to get between six and 12 millisieverts per year, depending which part of Denver you live. But a lot of that comes from the fact that it's a mile high city and it puts you, uh, the higher you go, the more. Uh, cosmic radiation you expose yourself to. So if you're, if you're a, free, a frequent flyer, you're getting more radiation, especially if you're taking long uh, transatlantic flights. But those are things that we, uh, we all voluntarily uh, uh, accept. I, I know I certainly don't worry about what I'm getting. Uh, because I, I certainly don't fly as much as the airline pilots. They uh, for, uh, have limits on the number of hours they can fly each year just to make sure that they're below a certain uh, uh, limit. But if you go to this town in, uh, in India, Kerala, the average background varies between 35 and 70 millisieverts per year. So that's roughly 10 to, uh, to 20 times what we in Canada get. Um, in, uh, if, if you like uh, going to healthy beaches, there's a, the Brazilians have this Guarapari beach uh, in uh, just, I think, south of, uh, of Rio, where you, the beach is not a very nice white sand, but it has a lot of black 
uh, pieces of uh, material on the, on the beach, and that's pitch blend. Pitch blend contains a lot of radium. So if you get there, you can get 35 millisieverts if you spend too much time at the beach. The population of, of, of the town doesn't get as much because they don't go to the beach as, as much as the, as the tourists do. They're busy working. Um, but then there's Ramsar in Iran where they have a natural spring which has a very high levels of radium in the, in the water. And they, uh, their average in the town is around about similar to, to Kerala's, but their maximum uh, exposures uh, have been uh, determined to be about 260 millisieverts per year, which is 100 times roughly what, what we get. But the interesting thing is they're all healthy and they've done multiple studies and they can't identify any changes due to radiation. There's no blood changes, white cell counts are normal. Uh, so the, the question is what is happening and we'll Perhaps we can very briefly touch on that. I, I could spend the whole of this lecture talking about that topic, but what has become more and more uh, a consensus amongst radiation biologists and some of the medical community who are more into nuclear medicine uh, is that the, uh, uh, there are a number of mechanisms which basically protect the, the way nature is, we've adapted, uh, evolved, because we evolved in a sea of radiation, and we still live in a sea of radiation, low-level radiation nonetheless. But there, so there are three, uh, three different uh, mechanisms which uh, take place if you're immediately exposed, one of which is that the, uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the body has uh, what they call oxidative uh, reactions, where, which we all have. These are biochemical oxidation uh, reactions. And without them, we wouldn't actually have been able to survive as long as we have. And basically, they uh, act to uh, suppress some of the uh, effects of the radiation on the cells. The other thing is there's, uh, the cells also have their, what you might call their stormtroopers. Hmm. So uh, basically these, the damage that is being induced is basically double-stranded DNA ruptures. So breaking of, of this double-stranded DNA, which is part of the genetic, uh, genetic makeup. And what happens is that the, uh, if a cell encounters uh, has, has the DNA, double strand DNA rupture, these other cells, the protective cells, come and they kill that cell. If they fail to kill that cell, then there's a third uh, a, a reaction uh, or defense uh, which uh, is associated with, again, uh, a, 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 an isolation of the broken of, of the cell and potential repair. So the, the third one that actually precedes the second one. There are a DNA repair mechanisms. If it's not effective, that's when the stormtroopers come in. But then there's a longer term ad adaptive uh, response, one of which is called the bystander effect. So if a cell gets damaged, it can uh, release uh, bio uh, uh, chemicals which are triggers uh, a neighboring cells and, the na and will actually kill the neighboring cells. So it tries to l assumes that there's more widespread damage and it will, uh, and this has been observed. Uh, in fact, we've, at McMaster, we've got a, a, a group of researchers who do well, nice fancy experiments where they can irradiate an individual cell and then observe the impacts of that. Uh, and they are part of the a number of people have been uh, working on this uh, bystander effect. So the, the bottom line is that you, there are other, there are biological 
or biochemicals, which are the oxidative uh, reactions, which can also kill, um, not kill, produce a, a double strand DNA ruptures. So you've got a com competition between the two. The rates at which uh, these are occurring tend to be much higher just due to our normal body functions. Uh, we, we, we need that oxidative uh, reaction in order to uh, function in an aerobic environment. We need the oxygen, but it also uh, uh, can uh, be uh, chemically uh, active in the body. So the, at the low levels, uh, and by low levels I'm talking about in the range of 100 to 200 millisieverts, these come in to play and uh, if you get very high uh, levels, sort of in the thousands or sort of 500, 600,000 millisieverts, then the damage is too much for the body to, to repair. And that's when you get the, the, the deaths occurring. Um, in order to be killed instantaneously by uh, radiation because of imp uh, damage to your, your organs, you're looking more at the 20,000 uh, millisieverts, very, very high. Uh, so with that uh, very brief, uh, the, uh, oh, that's just pointing out. Now what I'm going to do now is just quickly, because I don't want to, I'm not sure what time I have. Well, it, it keeps going as, yeah. uh, yeah. as long as we have half an hour or so. For oh yeah, sure, no, I'll, I'll, I'm try, I'll try and wrap it up in about 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So we uh, come back to electrical energy and the technology options. Uh, and this is where I'm much probably going to be a little controversial. And uh, some people are much going to be upset at what I'm saying, but it's my opinion. Uh, so uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to take questions on why I think this way. But uh, basically electricity, I believe, is, it's not a matter of belief, is the lifeblood of modern economies. I'm, it's very difficult to think of anything that we do today which doesn't require us to turn on the light, plug in a kettle, charge your cell phone, and cell phones have become ubiquitous. Uh, uh, so the, without electricity, even if we had uh, you, if we have, as I do, a natural gas heating furnace, being able to ignite the natural gas by itself is not adequate. I need electricity to drive the blower. Otherwise, I don't distribute it in the house effectively. So the, there's, as I said, very little that we do that doesn't require electricity. And that's where the issue of, uh, and the controversy comes in about the options. There are the people who say, no radiation, there's no safe level of radiation. Not true. There's no, scient uh, the scientific evidence that's developing is saying that at low levels, and I'm talking now of this 100 to 200 millisieverts, there, there is no effect. The, the operators at, at Fukushima, they had a limit of 250 millisieverts imposed. None of them have experienced any uh, uh, deleterious impact, and they're not expected uh, that there will be. But we have, uh, in terms of getting back to where I started, the climate change, what I, I personally believe is that, is that we have to have the low carbon options. And Nuclear is one, renewables is another. And in my mind, it's not one or the other, it's both. And the reason for that is, and I'll go into that shortly, is that if we said we were going to only have renewables, then basically with current technology, uh, it's wind. Solar, nice, but the technology is not there for uh, uh, at the present time. The other 
option is to say, okay, if we have, if we have uh, these uh, renewables, we have to recognize that they produce electricity intermittently. They don't keep producing 24 hours a day, uh, 365 days, whatever it is, uh, a year. So you need, you need the base load, but you also, if, if you're going to do ba uh, base load, then I claim that nuclear is the option we should have. Natural gas is a fill-in, but it's not the best way to use natural gas. Natural gas is a very valuable resource. It's valuable because if we use it to generate electricity, we only get effectively 40, up to about 40 odd percent of the energy content that's in the natural gas because of the steam cycle. If we use it in commercial and residential heating, modern furnaces give us 98, almost 99 percent efficiency. So that's, we're not sending waste heat up the chimney, uh, basically. Uh, so natural gas, but the other thing is natural gas is a feedstock for the chemical and plastics industry. So there are some benefits to plastics. Uh, and in a sense, uh, if you all remember the graduate, uh, the advice to uh, Dustin Hoffman is, it's all, in the, you know, the future is in the plastics. Yeah, well, it does appear it, it has been uh, there. Mm. It's, it's, it, there have been um, some benefits, but also that has uh, environmental impacts. So we have to uh, try and minimize environmental impacts. Uh, so natural gas as, a, as an option to reduce carbon emissions is there, but it's not a very efficient one uh, because A, uh, it still uh, emits uh, about 65% uh, uh, of the emissions compared to that from coal, so it's not very low. And plus the fact is that we, when we burn it for electricity, we're only getting uh, 40 uh, around 40 percent uh, of of the uh, of the combustion energy, so it's it's not a uh, in my view not a it's a short term one. It's taken over just because of costs, and we'll just I'll look at that shortly. But now to bring it back now, instead of looking globally, let's look at uh, at locally and look at Ontario. Look at the 2013 uh, long term energy plan. And you can see the basically there is the, uh, the planning for shutdown of, of Pickering, so they're reducing the nuclear uh, down from 12,900 megawatts to 9,900 megawatts. So that's basically taking, shutting down Pickering. Uh, replacing to replace that the. Uh, adding some more uh, natural gas and a little bit more hydro and planning on a large increment in renewables, which is fine, except that the renewables, uh, what matters, this is capacity. When you talk about megawatts, that's how much you can generate one at, a, at any point in time if conditions are right. The, what matters is actually what energy you produce, and that's called capacity factor. So uh, capacity factors for, for nuclear run in the, in the 90 percent range. For uh, wind, and, uh, wind, it's about somewhere between 30 and 20 percent. And the best information we have there is actually from Germany. What happens as you increase the number of, uh, of, of wind farms, not every location that you put a farm has the best wind. So usually the first ones that go in are in the best wind locations. You'll find 30%. Then the next ones that go in are less uh, effective. So the, the actual average capacity factor drops. So Germany is around about 20%. They started at 30%. The solar, which is a very small component in, in Germany, uh, is only about uh, around about 10 percent capacity factor. So what that means when you when you take that uh, 10,700 
100 megawatts of uh, installed capacity and account for the capacity factor, the, and in terms of the energy you're producing, it's only equivalent to about having 2,600 uh, a unit running constantly, 24 hours a day. If you produce uh, that, that would be the equivalent uh, amount of energy being produced from the wind farm. So you have to recognize that intermittency is, a, is an issue. So the next thing is to say, well, okay, well, it's not a matter. We, you know, of course, we're going to get energy storage. We're going to develop energy storage devices. That's nice. It would be helpful. It would uh, enable us to most probably reduce the, uh, the natural gas that wasteful natural gas uh, component. Uh, but by itself, it's not, wind plus storage is not the silver bullet. Because in order to store the energy that you need to supply when the wind isn't blowing, you have to have, uh, if it's 30% capacity factor, you have to have roughly three times as much uh, install capacity so you can generate that other two-thirds when the wind is blowing, well, when the, there is capacity from the wind. So you have to overbuild the system. As your capacity factors drop, the amount that you overbuild will go from three times up towards five times, which is where the 20% is. Now, the, the Germans encountered that, and what do they do about it? Well, their short-term solution was build a lot more coal stations. And these are brown coal stations, which are pretty bad polluters. So the uh, Germany single-handedly has basically blown the uh, European targets for carbon emissions. They're just producing large amounts. And you could say, okay, why didn't they go to natural gas? Well, there they were concerned about reliability of supply. And that is because they get, no, they don't have natural, significant amounts of natural gas, they buy from Russia. Russia is the, the giant of natural gas in, in Europe. So they're getting large amounts, uh, they, they, if they went to natural gas from, from, uh, from Russia, they are now going to be subject to uh, pressures. Other, other, other countries, like the Ukraine, has had issues where their natural gas supplies from Russia have been cut off for political reasons. So that's not a very good option for them. And they stayed, quite rightly, stayed away from it. Um, but the, the other thing is that uh, they have been, uh, they've been helped quite considerably by nuclear power. Not in Germany, because they shut down uh, eight of their old units. Uh, but nuclear power, in particular from exports from France, France, as you know, has a very large uh, nuclear power uh, component in their energy system, which is about 75% is nuclear. And that came about in the time of 1972 oil crisis because there was, uh, uh, as one uh, French energy minister said uh, subsequently when asked the question, why did you go nuclear? He said, well, quite simple. We have no coal, we have no gas, we have no other energy option. Uh, so they, that drove them to nu uh, choose nuclear because that provided them with the uh, uh, with reliability of supply and uh, some energy independence. They had uranium mines in some of their former colonies as well. Um, so if we were to replace nuclear and all these other op op options. Uh, uh, such as natural gas with with wind, we would have to basically take that roughly at, at 20,000 megawatts there and multiply it by three. So you need about 60,000 uh, of, of megawatts installed capacity, additional capacity of wind, assuming it can still have good wind sites, which we don't necessarily have. Um, and could be all the way up to 100,000 if you ended up with 20% capacity factor. So that's 
part of the conundrum. Uh, and that's why I don't see any single silver bullet. I'm not pushing nuclear as, a, as the only single bullet, but nuclear, in my mind, is the key uh, element to stabilize energy supply, electrical energy supply. Um, and this one, I'm not going to spend too much time, it just shows you the, if you had, if you weren't generating uh, anything from an intermittent supply, in other words, was shut down, you'd need to have uh, a, a backup, a full backup. So if, uh, if you said you, uh, you wanted to get uh, 10,000 megawatts of, uh, of, of, of uh, electricity capacity, but your intermittent supply was producing nothing, then you're going to have to have 10,000 megawatts of backup. If you uh, had 30% uh, capacity, which is the red line, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, sorry, the, uh, this line here, the gray line, that's 30% renewable uh, capacity, you have to have the other 70% in backup to give you the, your, your demand. So basically, as you drop the capacity factors, you need more and more backup. So that is the, the issue of planning. And it's not an easy one uh, because the, there is, again, no free lunch. It, uh, when you're looking at these large wind farms, the cost of, uh, uh, of, of, of wind energy is about the same as in the same order of magnitude as nuclear. So it's not that they, it's a cheap thing to put up. They're actually very expensive when you're building them in, in large quantities. And that's what the Germans have found. Um, so that now brings us to, again, uh, where does nuclear stand? This is part of the f now finally getting to future. <laughs> uh, we, if we look back in history, uh, the, um, around about 1968, the first commercial uh, nuclear power plants came into service. There was a rapid uh, build-up in uh, in, in the US, um, and so, uh, equally some in, the, um, in, in Europe, or outside of North America at that time. Some of that build up there was actually uh, in Canada. So North America is US plus uh, Canada. Uh, outside of North America, it's Europe, Asia, and um, Right, and a little bit in South, South America, essentially two stations in, um, in South Africa, Kuburg near Cape Town, where I studied. Just for your interest, uh, just a minor correction, I'm actually not South African, I'm Zimbabwean. I was born in Zimbabwe, but I went and studied in South Africa. And Cape Town I can recommend as one of the most beautiful cities in the world, but that's digressing. Uh, but we see at the after Three Mile Island, if I just go back, watch my fingers, um, there was a slowing down in North America. It didn't stop completely, uh, but basically they had a, a, a large number of plants that were in the pipeline. They continued to build them and then tailed off. Uh, so in Canada, for example, the last uh, units to come and service were at Darlington in 1992, so they're part of that little piece there. However, in Europe, there was a significant increase, primarily driven by France. That was when they were building there. If you remember, 1972 was the oil crisis, and they went, decided on nuclear, and basically built their fleet, nuclear fleet, up very rapidly in the, the following decade. And it continued as other countries, uh, both in, 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 in Europe and in Asia, uh, including Japan, started to build uh, their fleets. The, but what you'll notice is that after Chernobyl, there wasn't a, a rapid reduction or stop. Uh, the rate of, of increase did slow down, but didn't stop. And that was because it was being driven in large measure by energy-hungry countries. 
and those include uh, China, but also a lot of uh, Europeans and some in India. And finally, after Fukushima, uh, things didn't stop either. Uh, what you see is the projection in North America, that's <coughs> primarily in the US where they're building currently four new nuclear stations. The big component is happening in Asia, primarily China, because they have been burning coal like crazy. You've all seen pictures of their cities and the smog and people with masks trying to uh, get around. So they, they, their emissions are extremely high and they're trying to limit that by going to alternatives. They, they're going, building nuclear plants, they're also building uh, uh, renewable uh, wind, uh, wind farms. Uh, so, but that is also happening in other countries in Asia, in particular uh, in, in uh, India, not as rapidly as in, uh, in China. Russia is also uh, expanding because they recognize that, they, uh, that their um, natural gas is, is, a, uh, is, a, is a resource, but it is a depleting resource, so they need to, uh, uh, they don't appear to have yet have any, discovered any uh, shale gas there. Mm -hmm. But, so if you look at the current state, and th this is the, uh, the, uh, the light blue is nuclear plants under construction, and the dark blue is the additional ones that are being planned. And as you can see, China is outpacing everyone there, just because they have such a large population, large energy uh, demand, and they see nuclear as one of the key components to low reducing carbon emissions. Uh, so uh, you can say, okay, if we don't, if we forget about climate change and don't worry about carbon emissions, just keep trucking along, we should be burning coal. In fact, <coughs> the US is a gorilla of coal. It has more coal reserves than any other country in the world. They moved away from uh, or coal. They tried to uh, produce clean coal. <coughs> I'm not sure. It sounds to me a bit like an oxymoron, but uh, perhaps they'll d uh, develop a technology to reduce carbon emissions, but it's very difficult to see how you don't get carbon emissions from combusting something which is essentially carbon. Uh, so it's, uh, oh, there's a, I don't quite, I m might just be dumb, uh, I don't quite see the connection, but maybe, maybe there is and I'll learn it while I'm still around. <laughs> um, the other thing is waste management. Uh, it's also seen as a, uh, and I, I just throw this in just for the sake of a uh, little bit of, 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 of thought. Uh, we, talk, we, we worry about putting our spent fuel back down in the ground in a deep hole. Uh, the problem with that, in my mind, is that what we're putting back down is primarily uranium-238, which is a, uh, uh, a potential, a fuel, it is a fuel potential. You can uh, burn uranium-238 by transmuting it in other reactors, such as fast reactors. Molten salt reactors uh, can do some of the, uh, that job as well. So the, but the issue is always, well, it's going to, if we put it down, how can we be sure that it's not going to leak out and, and get into the groundwater. Well, yeah, we've got to address that. That is a safety issue. We've got, there is science and technology that's been applied, uh, both in Canada, the US, although they swing hot and cold because of political issues between the Democrats and the Republicans on this kind of issue. And uh, as, as proceeding actually uh, as a, uh, more advanced in Finland and Sweden. But uh, if we look around at what nature can tell us, uh, there are actually natural repositories of fission, yeah, uh, fission products that have occurred uh, back in, um, in, in, in billions of years uh, uh, ago in, uh, in uh, Gabon in uh, West Africa 
and these are referred to as the Oklo Natural Fission Reactors. And you might be Google Oklo, you'll get a lot of information. Uh, was discovered these reactors, and it's not just one, there are I think about 10 of them located in, 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 in sort of close vicinity. And it was discovered by the French. They were in Gabon uh, prospecting for uranium, came across this particular deposit, did their drilling, sent the, uh, the, uh, the uh, drill cores back to France for analysis. And then the question came back, what the heck is going on here? There's, instead of the 0.71% uranium-235 in this deposit, there's only about 0.35, roughly half the, uh, the amount of uranium-235. Now that percentage is pretty much constant around the world because it originates from the Big Bang and it's been decaying away very slowly. And at the time, if you work back to the time uh, where they, they uh, believe this occurred, the, um, the uh, deposits, uh, there were 16, uh, actually I actually got the number there, 16 separate reactors uh, um, in, at Oklo plus uh, one reactor at another site 35 kilometers away. Um, at the time, sort of a billion years ago, the, there's about 3% enrichment of uranium-235 naturally in the uranium and that's about the enrichment that the American light water reactors run with, between 3 and 5 percent. So it was uh, ready for all it needed to start natural fissioning was to have some water. And this deposit was located in an alluvial plain covered by a clay layer and water seeped down under the clay layer and entered the deposit. The initiated, because of uh, cosmic radiation, which includes neutrons, initiated a fission chain reaction which continued, generated energy, heated the water and eventually produced steam. And they, the hypothesis is that the steam basically geezered up through the alluvial clay so they got steam, a bit like a, a, an old smoky or whatever it is in, in, in the US. Uh, but then shut it down because the water was all gone. Water would seep in, start it up again, and they continued doing that for uh, 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 sort of about 700, they estimate 700 million years. They can uh, estimate that by looking at the long-lived fission products and seeing how much remains uh, of the fission products that are very long-lived fission products. So they uh, were able to do a lot of forensic work and basically uh, the other thing that they did was to actually go and look at the deposits and see where were the fission products. And the fission products had migrated about two meters away from what was a reactor. So this was in a migration over 1.8 billion years. So basically if you have the right uh, material there, uh, which is in particular clay material, and that is why they, in the repositories that they're designing, they want to embed the, uh, the, uh, the fuel in, in, uh, in containers in what they call bentonite clay, which is pretty impermeable. So that's uh, where we learn a little bit from nature. Uh, we can use a bit of, uh, I think always a bit of guidance from nature when we do find it, and this is a good example. So that brings us to the uh, NAVAC uh, to the energy policy conundrum, which I call uh, basically where we start looking at uh, uh, our policy options, and then we go through uh, selecting options, putting them uh, in place, monitoring their performance, and then finally, after we've monitored their performance, can't reach well, then you end up with the half the fact the public perceptions that develop over those options, which then feed back into subsequent cycles of energy policy. But unfortunately, there's a long lag time in this process. So you're looking at, it's not a matter of just turning a switch, you're looking at 
decades of planning and decision making, getting things in place and then finding out what went right and what went wrong and then feeding it back and trying to improve. So the uh, continuous improvement process tends to be uh, long and it also gets interrupted by the time scale of policy makers who are usually politicians and they have a four to five year uh, planning horizon which involves the time between elections and policy changes can be made quite quickly following an election. So you have these problems in getting a, in place a, a good consistent policy. The best thing you hope for is that you've got a strong uh, civil service with good technical capabilities which I believe we have in Ontario, uh, but the civil service, as we know, is, does get influenced by political mass, so, so directions do change. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a bit of a, at times, a hit and miss uh, and hope for the best thing. So the, my, uh, in, in closing, whoop, this is where people most probably either throw uh, uh, flowers or or tomatoes and eggs at me, uh, but don't mind, I can duck. Uh, the, uh, what I suggest we should be doing in, in terms of moving towards a uh, resilient energy supply, and I think we do need a resilient energy supply uh, because of the concerns over climate change impacts. Uh, so we, you need proven robustness and reliability in high capacity factors, low carbon emissions, and low fuel costs. So for the base load, nuclear and hydro are the candidates. Hydro is, is great. It does have a bigger, uh, in terms of land mass, environmental impact because of the dams that you have to build and the land that you lose and the people get displaced <coughs> by that. Uh, uh, nuclear has a small footprint, uh, but then there's the uh, public uh, opposition uh, regarding uh, regarding nuclear and safety and environmental issues, uh, but I, I'm not of the same opinion, obviously. Um, then you select the renewables, uh, intermittent electricity generation on the most developed option. This is, so looking at a, a path, it's not necessarily the end state, but it's hard to get from here to there and lower carbon emissions. Because if we don't lower carbon emissions, I'm sorry, I believe, and the, the evidence that is coming from the scientists, climate scientists, is say, and there was just an article a, a couple of weeks back that there was, they now got some additional proof of the role of carbon emissions in climate change. So I'll be interested to, to review that. But wind is the most developed option. It is the uh, uh, solar, while it's nice, I, uh, is not as developed other than for small installations. So you could look at putting solar on, on roofs, but the, when I say it's not the most developed, it hasn't been proven the life of solar panels is still a, an open question, which is undergoing research. Uh, we know with wind, uh, the, what, the, what the challenges are. We do know that the, the life of the big wind turbines uh, is the indications coming is that they are somewhat limited because of things like fatigue fracture, uh, fracturing of the, the big blades, which could damage uh, and cause them to break. And uh, natural gas, which has been the, uh, the one that everyone's running to, to me is, uh, is a, a, a short term a knee-jerk reaction driven by simply by economics uh, and that is because of the low cost of natural gas coming from shale uh, uh, gas fracking but the shale the fracking process is perhaps equally uh, has a bit of the the nuclear not in my backyard uh, elements people don't like they don't mind if you're fracking over there, but don't do it near where I am. Uh, 
and then you get the anti-fracking uh, videos where some poor fellow or, or lady goes to open tap and next thing there's a, a flame of, uh, of, of gas uh, emitting from her, her, uh, her tap. Now I'm not sure if that is right, maybe it was just that they connected up the gas line to the, uh, to the water line, but uh, there's no way I can uh, demonstrate that. But as I say, natural gas is a, is, is a, uh, is a valuable, valuable, valuable commodity, commodity for other uses other than generating electricity. Um, and uh, it is an option where hydro is not available. Uh, so uh, what you do to support the path, you've got to focus in and obviously if you're looking to get a social license, uh, you need to address the uh, concerns people have about safety and environment, environmental concerns. However, so it's not just a matter of the of accidents, but it's also a matter of what the consequences of of uh, of low dose uh, radiation are. And that's where the radiation biologists are. Uh, playing a role, they are generating some very interesting and useful information which help inform decisions. Because otherwise you end up with uh, being in a, a situation as Port Hope was when uh, Helen Caldicott, who believes that there is no safe level of radiation, came to Port Hope uh, and then said everybody should be relocated because they're all potentially going to die of cancer. Because, but that connection between low dose radiation and cancer is increasingly not is a figment. The scientific evidence is that at the low dose of what they call uh, low energy uh, uh, um, uh, transfer radiation, which is gamma and beta, which is a predominant uh, radiation that comes from the uh, nuclear fuel, the Alpha is in the actinides, uh, the uranium and plutonium, and that's contained within the fuel. And we're not actually exposed to it, other than uh, miners uh, in uranium mines, where they didn't recognize in the early days the issues with uh, the, uh, the effect of alpha uh, particles. In particular, alpha is easy to shield because you can get a piece of paper and shield yourself from alpha emissions just because they are highly charged and they give up their energy over very, very short distances. That means that we will tend, if we get exposed, we tend to get uh, the uh, energy being deposited in our skin, reddening of the skin. If we have a lot of it, we'll get blistering, which is similar to uh, being exposed to energy from a fire. So basically, Radiation is just energy, and we have to, uh, and it's a matter of where and how penetrating it is. Uh, if it's ionized uh, radiation, it tends to uh, give up, uh, and it's so it's alpha and beta will, uh, beta is just like an electron, beta will give up its energy over a longer distance. Gamma rays both have no charge, but once they enter, matter, they do, they can ionize uh, material and then you can get the ionization uh, from internally from the gamma rays, ionizing material. But because they are, are not charged, they penetrate much greater distances, so they, their energy transfer is over a much longer path. Neutrons, however, are a different matter and you don't get those uh, in any quantity other than in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the reactor. Um, so uh, wind, we're going to have to accept nature's intermittency until energy, viable energy storage systems emerge, but the storage does require a large overbuilding of installed capacity. Storage systems are not a silver bullet. And we should also evaluate threat risk of climate change, extreme event hazards, on that source, on wind. We know that if you get wind at 
the velocities are too high, you've got to shut the turbines down. If they get very high, as they might in, a, in one of these climate change storms, you can actually damage the wind turbine. So, but that is right now, it's not a risk that is, has been addressed because the, the percentage of energy from wind is still very low. In Ontario, we're only getting about 4% each year energy of our energy supply from, from wind. So, uh, and we also, in all cases, you've got to plan for emergency response, plan for the bad things. You've got to ask yourself, what if this happens? What are the impacts? What can I do to mitigate? What do I need to mitigate? And that means planning, pre-planning, not doing what happened in Fukushima where they hadn't pre-planned, they didn't have adequate emergency response capability, poor communication. It led to the, 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 the so somewhat surreal situation where uh, as the uh, accident developed, the Prime Minister said, I'm taking charge. And at that point, you have to ask yourself, what the heck is going on? That some, I, if it was Prime Minister Harper saying that, we would say, what the heck does he know about it? Uh, you know, the, and it, the, with all due respect to this Prime Minister of Japan, he knew nothing. He was being advised by people in his re regulatory organization who were not, uh, which, were, which was deficient. So he couldn't uh, handle it. And as a result of that, they basically re, uh, they, they basically banished their old, or disbanded their old regulatory organization. They put a new one in place with uh, advice and guidance from the International Atomic Energy Agency, from uh, the US, from Europe and other sources. So the whole point is that if you don't plan for something and be ready with, if you need equipment to be bring, it, bring it on, you are going to be in trouble. And that was what the problem was. One of the problems with the on-site emergency response at Fukushima, they relied on fire engines coming from surrounding munis municipalities. Unfortunately, the tsunami washed away a lot of that equipment, so it wasn't there. So they had to then try and get equipment from other uh, locations further away. More time was spent bringing that on line, or in, on site, and then there were problems with not being able to quickly connect it. And, Time is of the essence when you respond to a, a, an event, a bad event. If you don't respond, as we saw in uh, a good example of, of poor uh, emergency response, non-nuclear, but was Katrina, Hurricane Katrina. The, uh, the uh, what they call FEMA, Federal Emergency uh, Measures Agency in the, in the US, knew, the, knew the, um, the, uh, the hurricane was coming. They knew it was going to be a severe one. They had enough uh, meteorological information to say it was going to be bad. They knew there was a potential to breach the levees, but they didn't bring uh, equipment and personnel to uh, uh, New Orleans until after the event. So the days went by with people uh, washed out of their homes, you know, sitting in. Uh, football stadiums without any uh, uh, help. And so everything just went down the tubes. Sandy, which was bigger in, in size than Katrina, didn't result in, uh, in as a, a fraction of the deaths compared to Katrina. And that was because uh, the mayor of New York, the governor of New York, uh, uh, the governor of New Jersey, was saying Chris Christie, they all got together and they pre-planned and put emergency response equipment and resources, so not just equipment but people, in place so they could get into, uh, into the uh, cities and locations where damage had occurred quickly. So there's not rocket science, it's just good planning and deployment of resources. But thinking ahead and you have to ask, and that's what we do in nuclear safety, you should, you've got to Ask yourself if you're a good, if you have a good uh, nuclear safety culture. You always have to ask yourself, 
what if this happens? Forget about, I view this, forget about frequency, just you know, frequency used for your design basis. Once you go beyond the design, you have to ask yourself, what if this occurs? I don't care what frequency, but if it does occur, <coughs> what is the, whoops, as I say, I do sometimes wave my hands, uh, what are the range of, uh, of outcomes, the consequences? How do we, uh, what can we do to mitigate? Do we have the resources available and have we pre-planned them to take the mitigating actions? And that's, uh, you know, so if, if, if you think you can design any uh, building or a, a system or, or plant such that it is impervious to any challenge that you throw at it, I'm afraid, afraid uh, nature will disprove that assumption. So you have to accept that there is no such thing as zero risk in this world. There is risk, but we have to find ways in which we can manage the risk. And that's part of, uh, there are a number of different components there, and that is part of actually delivering safety, is knowing how to identify what is a potential risk. Don't do it necessarily just by frequency or numbers. That's, in my judgment, is a, a mugs game. Uh, because you always have to, you should, uh, if you use the frequency or uh, probability, you'll find that there's, along the way, someone says, oh, it's so low, that's, it's incredible. We don't have to consider it. And then I bring uh, up the, uh, the issue of the black swan event. The black swan event is an event that we have judged to be so unlikely that it's incredible until it happens. And then after that, we suddenly realize why it happened. So we, you know, we have to be ready to handle black swan events. And that is what I've been preaching for the last, uh, ever since Fukushima. Uh, some people don't like me because they like the frequencies, but tough. <laughs> okay. <That's true. laughs> okay, and the conclusion, the three, that's, this is just the kind of uh, parenthood statements. Uh, the world's population faces hostile changes from glo global climate change. I emphasize glo global because uh, if the potential outcomes of, of, of extended climate change is going to impact a large number of millions and millions of people, billions of people in fact, in particular those living near the coast, and we need inexpensive, reliant, uh, resilient energy to support both economic development and meet the climate change challenges. Um, and we should uh, uh, choose uh, select energy options uh, that can either contribute to or mitigate climate change. Uh, so we have to look at to what extent are they contributing to climate change and to what extent are they mitigating. And finally, the last point is that the uh, Accumulating radiation biology and epidemiological evidence says that lower radiation doses between 100 and 200 in that range uh, are not harmful. So there does appear to be a threshold. So the, the old uh, theory or the assumption that was imposed by the uh, International C uh, Committee for Radiation Protection was that there was, it was called the LNT or linear no threshold theory is uh, gradually and increasingly being disproved. So in that sense, I believe there is a future for nuclear. Thank you.